Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues and guests, it is with great honor and privilege that I introduce to you Dr. Bonganin Lovuyulala, an eminent figure in the field of chemistry and a distinguished academic leader at the National University of Science and Technology in Bulawayo, Zimbabwe. Dr. Yulala holds a PhD in chemistry from the University of the Witwatersrand, Johannesburg, with a research focus on the characterization, bioavailability, and health risk assessment of mercury in dust impacted by gold mining. His academic journey also includes a postgraduate diploma in higher education from NUST and a Master of Science degree from the University of the Western Cape. With a career spanning over a decade, Dr. Yolala has made significant contributions to the field of chemistry, particularly in environmental fate, transport, and risk assessment of chemical contaminants. His expertise extends to the use of low-cost adsorbents in mitigating industrial effluent and mine wastewater, as well as the development of alternative energy sources. As the head of Department of Chemistry at NUST, Dr. Yulala has demonstrated exceptional leadership skills and a strong commitment to academic excellence. He has been instrumental in curriculum development, teaching a wide range of courses from introductory levels to advanced master's programs. His teaching philosophy emphasizes active student participation critical thinking, and real-world applications of chemistry concepts. In addition to his teaching responsibilities, Dr. Yolala is actively involved in research, supervising both undergraduate and postgraduate students in various projects related to environmental remediation and sustainable technologies. Dr. Yolala's dedication to education and research is further exemplified through his community engagement initiatives, where he has contributed to educational enrichment programs and Humanitarian efforts, such as feeding students affected by COVID-19. As a member of professional organizations like the Zimbabwe Chemical Society and the South African Chemical Institute, Dr. Yolala continues to stay at the forefront of scientific advancements and contributes to the scholarly community through his role as a reviewer and external examiner, his skills in analytical instrumentation, data interpretation, and organizational leadership make him a valuable asset to the academic community and a role model for aspiring scientists and educators, please. Join me in welcoming Dr. Bongoni Nlovu Yolala, a visionary leader and a catalyst for innovation in the field of chemistry. On behalf of all the collaborators of the Joint Asian African Labs, JAL, initiative, I am honored to extend a heartfelt request to Dr. Bongoni Nlovu Yolala to deliver a lecture that embodies his expertise, insights, and invaluable contributions to the field of chemistry and environmental science. Good morning. Welcome to a series of lectures um, conducted uh, during the week of World Water Day. Um, this is a seminar uh, that will run for three days, uh, culminating on the last day, which is uh, Friday, where the World Water Day is being celebrated, which is the 22nd of March. My name is Dr. Yalala. Uh, senior lecturer at the University of Science and Technology. And I'm going to be presenting on cholera, a waterborne disease. Now, there's a background to this. Um, cholera has uh, been endemic, particularly in uh, undeveloped countries, uh, particularly in Africa and some countries in, in Africa. And we in Zimbabwe have particularly suffered a huge frequency of cholera epidemics in the last uh, five to 10 years. And currently we are sitting on a situation where as of uh, 31st January, there have been a total number of 22,000 cases that have been reported with 71 deaths confirmed and 416 suspected deaths that have been reported <clears throat> from 61 districts across the 10 provinces. So for us, it's quite a challenge. And so that's the background as to why we are going to look at cholera. Um, and uh, try and understand what it is. So the presentation presentation 
is going to have this format. We're going to have an introduction, uh, talk about diagnosis, uh, method of transmission, treatment, and prevention. So we all know cholera is uh, a disease uh, caused by the Vibio cholera, which is a bacteria, and uh, it is characterized by acute um, diarrhea. Uh, it is spread by ingestion of contaminated food uh, or water, and water is normally contaminated by fecal mat. Uh, cholera is an infectious disease that causes severe watery diarrhea, which can lead to dehydration and even death if untreated. The infection is often mild with uh, mild or without symptoms, but sometimes can be severe and life-threatening. It is spread by ingestion of contaminated food and water and uh, can lead, can be fatal. Cholera has become an increasing, an increasing public health concern around the world, particularly in developing countries with inadequate access to clean water and sanitation. It kills an estimated uh, 95,000 people each year and infects about 2.9 million more. So it's quite a, a, a challenge. Um, as we've said um, I, in, the, in the presentation, I'll keep using Zimbabwe as an example because of the experience that we have and the challenges that we are facing. Uh, this is uh, what uh, the VPO cholera looks like, <clears throat> the bacteria. It's a uh, coma-shaped, uh, gram-negative, uh, aerobic or falcated anaerobic, anaerobic bacillus. A bacillus that varies in size from 1 to 3 and in length from 0 0.5 to ampere micrometers in diameter. It grows in salts and fresh water, can survive and multiply in brackish water by infecting core peppers and has, an, has over 150 identified uh, serotypes based on O antigen, only the O1 and O190, 139 are toxigenic and cause the cholera disease. Two categories of the O1 serotypes, which is the classical and the E1 tau. Its antigen structure consists of the flagella and the somatic O antigen. So bacteria can easily, are easily destroyed by coulter disinfectants, such as cresol and bleaching powder. The vibrio multiply in the lumen of the small intestine and produce an exotoxic entorotoxic toxin. So host factors, um, uh, children 10 times more susceptible than adults and uh, elderly also highly susceptible. Children is more understandable because of their development they are still developing, and so their body organs have not completely formed properly. So they are always going to be susceptible. The elderly is because they are immunocompromised, as a person is in their senior years. The body's function is compromised. Its immunity is also highly challenged. Sex equal in both male and female. Immunity less immune, higher risk. So those who are immune, uh, immune who have uh, a compromised immune system, generally are always at a higher risk. And people with low gastric acid acid levels. So that's a biochemical function. There are some people who, are, uh, who have conditions of low gastric acids or produce low gastric acids in the stomach. Therefore, those will also be susceptible. Then blood types are always a highly susceptible, followed by PA, B, followed by A, and eventually AB. 
So AP has a lesser risk. There hasn't been any scientific proof as to why um, the recessive blood group O is highly susceptible. The highest in the low socioeconomic groups, so those that are generally uh, in the poor, uh, low, low social classes in society will be highly susceptible. Why? Because um, Cholera is a disease that's generally highly affecting uh, people with a compromised sanitation uh, conditions. Movement of population, pilgrimage, marriages, fairs, festivals result in increased um, risk of exposure of infection. This is uh, quite true. We've seen a lot of um, this happening in Zimbabwe, um, where large groups now currently, because of the highly economic, socioeconomic problems that the country is undergoing, there's a lot of movement and a lot of large social gatherings, mainly for economic reasons where people gather to uh, conduct their trade, they are buying and selling. And so in such a setup, you are bound to find that the gatherings are far outweigh the sanitation provisions in a particular place. And therefore, once the sanitation conditions or, or, so, uh, or provisions that are made and the facilities are overwhelmed, then there's bound to be um, lack of use of proper sanitation conditions, so lack of uh, washing hands after visiting the restrooms, um, the restrooms being blocked because of uh, over being overwhelmed. So all these conditions have a general um problem of creating um opportunities for infection also culturally whenever they have uh, we have religious um, gatherings uh, you will find that the places that these religious gatherings are uh, conducted in will always be overwhelmed uh, so issues of sanitation become a a, a problem and therefore will be high chances of um, contamination and transmission. And we've seen also countries, neighboring countries, because of the economic movement, people moving between, um, across neighboring countries, Zambia, Malawi, Mozambique, South Africa, and Botswana, then there's bound to be high risk of transmission. So environmental factors is uh, when there is low access to safe water, which means um, many a case because there is lack of safe water, people will then use any uh, sources of water that is available to them. And more often than not, these open sources of water are prone to contamination. And because they are prone to contamination, then transmission does okay. Also food, uh, especially if we are looking at street vendors, the food that's sold in open markets, issues of sanitation and hygiene become uh, a priority. And if these are not taken care of, then the food that um, that is being sold, and like we've described, the issue of sanitation conditions and uh, provision and facilities are highly compromised because of these large gatherings due to economic activity. Therefore, people do not observe basic uh, hygiene and therefore you find they are touching the foodstuffs with dirty hands, which might be already exposed to uh, cholera and therefore the transmission occurs. People buy these wares, these food wares, and they is an increased uh, level of transmission. So certain human habit favoring water and soil pollution, instead of using the designated sanitation 
facilities people choose to then use um, uh, the open spaces um, uh, and so there's bound to be contamination of the soils and water and lack of basic etiquette in terms of observing hygiene practices and so that whole uh, human habit of failing to observe basic hygiene um, practice will then lead to uh, high levels of contamination and transmission. So level, low level, low standards of personal hygiene, lack of education, so low standards of personal hygiene where people do not use um, soap and water after you visit in the restrooms. So that's normally a big challenge in terms of cholera uh, transmission. So lack of education, poor quality of life as well. So when we look at lack of education, where people have no basic understanding of uh, of etiquette, or even information based on prevention of transmission of cholera and what the disease is generally about, can also lead to high levels of transmission. Poor quality of life, like we've described, if we're looking at the lower end of the social economic class, uh, the poor who have who have no access to clean, safe drinking water, poor housing conditions, living in a squalor, squalid environment, and um, all this creates an environment that has high factors of transmission, contamination of cholera. The prognosis is, uh, of cholera can vary depending on the severity of the de dehydration and how quickly the patient is given and responds to the treatments. Now, what are we describing? We're describing a situation as to if it is a few cases being reported from a particular locality that speaks to the frequency, that speaks to the severity of these cases will give rise to how um, the cholera um, uh, disease can be handled. Now, if it's in an outbreak setup where there's then high number of cases being uh, reported, then it becomes very important for people to react and react accordingly by isolating and then immediately administering treatment. If it is not quickly attended to, ultimately death will be the result. So death rates in untreated cholera can be as high as 50 to 60 percent during, during large outbreaks, but can be reduced to about 1 percent if treatment protocols control measures and preventative measures are rapidly put into action. Diagnosis must be clinical. Cholera should be considered in all cases where there's severe watery diarrhea and vomiting. So uh, these samples must be taken for clinical tests for the confirmation of whether the, it is cholera based or not. Traveling to affected areas and eating raw fruits and vegetables, um, there's need to be a strict uh, control in terms of traveling. Um, in some cases, it's always advisable to then put on a travel ban to restrict movement into affected areas. Um, and it comes to hygiene, there should be a strict adherence to personal hygiene. And so wherever there are these cases cropping up, the immediate implementation of all these measures must be put in place not distinguishing clinical manifestation for cholera. So the diagnosis, um, stool specimen and samples will be taken 
for analysis in the lab. Confirmation confirm the presence of cholera toxin by culture. You can also use a cholera rapid test deep sticks. You can also order additional tests to be carried out. This is done so that there is an immediate confirmation of presence of cholera toxin so that the implementation of the right treatment is uh, uh, immediately administered. Now complications that will occur, this describes the different various stages that a person who's been infected will undergo. They will present um, certain symptoms and signs. The first being that of dehydration. And uh, you are looking at a situation where when a person is highly dehydrated is because of uh, the continuous uh, effect of diarrhea. Diarrhea is a dangerous um, sign in, in cholera. Why? Because you lose your vital fluids. Uh, from your body and these fluids generally contain a lot of electrolytes and these electrolytes uh, contain uh, nutrients that are quite important to the functioning of the body and so the signs that you are dehydrated would be a uh, skin with a, a decreased tega and remains elevated after being pulled up and released. So that's a number one sign that you are highly dehydrated. And depending on the condition of your dehydrated, it is then recommended a particular set of treatment procedures that you must be, uh, you must undergo. So it's quite important that um, these signs are observed and uh, observed very well. Um, so if di diarrhea and vomiting are allowed to continue without taking any precautions, uh, the person will fall, the patient will normally fall into a hypo volume, volumic shock, which is due to loss of bicarbonate, loss of electrolytes, and this loss of electrolyte causes an imbalance, which leads to muscle cramps. So already the body is undergoing a shock. And the continued loss, uh, there will be a 5 to 10% of weight loss, which leads to hypotension, weakness, decreased skin turgor, and eventually will lead to your renal failure. And if not treated, renal failure will virtually lead to death. So these are the four major uh, signs that people must observe. So the first being dehydration. And uh, the last being a fatality, loss of life. So what are the risk factors? Uh, the risk factors is poor sanitary conditions. These are in developed countries. Why? Because developed countries have uh, well-developed uh, sanitation, hygiene systems put in place. Um, you'll find there's a lot of uh, developing countries that will uh, we suffer poor sanitary conditions. Uh, so continents like Asia, Africa, and Latin America, and like we've said, Zimbabwe is currently undergoing a number of uh, cholera outbreaks in the last 10 years. And you can see that a lot of it is alluded to poor sanitary conditions. And um, the second would be raw or uncooked foods. Um, for the fish eating communities, the water is contaminated. Therefore, the seafood coming from such contaminated environments 
will also lead to transmission, uh, raw fruits and vegetables, namely, namely like we say, street vending uh, with large um, gatherings, poor observation of hygiene practices can lead to contamination of these uh, fruits and vegetables. And if they are not thoroughly washed before consumption or cooked, there are high transmission risks that will be uh, uh, people will be exposed to. This is hypochlorhydria, so, such as children, older adults, and some medications. People with low levels of uh, stomach acids become prone. So here we're dealing with um, human conditions. And so children are generally susceptible because of uh, the development in their bodies, uh, they're still undergoing a lot of developments. Older people, um, because their systems are shutting down and uh, they are breaking down, so you find they will always be immunocompromised because of um, the aging body. And so also some individuals who may be undergoing medication, some medications have a tendency to um, expose you to uh, make you vulnerable to infection. And lastly, blood type O. Uh, reasons are not entirely clear. Like we've said, no scientific evidence as to why people with this blood group are susceptible and they are twice more likely to contract uh, cholera than a normal human, than a normal uh, any other human being with a different blood group. Now, modes of transmission. We've already said uh, poor sanitary conditions. Here we've got examples where you can see that the sewer is being overwhelmed and is constantly leaking. And the challenge with this kind of setup is this water in the residential area is flowing. It will find its way into river system natural river system and that breeds challenges. Natural river system and uh, unfortunately from some of our developments, you will find that our sources of water, which we then take or consume as drinking, will be fed by these rivers where these wastes leaking sewer flow into. So that's the biggest challenge, uh, the dilapidated sewer system, which is, un, which is in disrepair, which has not been maintained for a number of years. It's been overwhelmed because of growth of in population. And so you have uh, leaking raw untreated sewer, which virtually finds itself into natural river systems, which virtually pour into dams which would act as our major sources of water. So that's the biggest challenge. We also have raw sewer dumping. Like we've described, the capacity of our sewer systems are, have not been repaired or have not been uh, improved. They have not scaled up the capacity due to an increase or an influx in population, an increase in population um, so these challenges result in the capacity of the sewer treatment works failing to treat and therefore pumping out raw sewer into <clears throat> river systems which will virtually supply our dams. And those dams can generally be sources of drinking water. Also open wells and boreholes. So any flow from these leaking um, sewer, untreated raw sewer, can find its way into wells, which has been say, which has been the case in some parts of the country where uh, people were using, consuming open, uh, consuming water from the open wells, which had been contaminated by raw sewer, and hence people were then able to contract cholera through that systems. So even shallow wells 
Um, particularly, this is a, a situation that you find in the rural areas where there are no proper set sanitation and potable water uh, provision. So these are the challenges that we will then experience. Also, in terms of building and developing um, uh, uh, your latrines, which are very close to your, your groundwater sources. So there's always going to be leak, uh, leaching and uh, ground flow in the direction towards your groundwater sources leading to contamination. So such things, need, one needs to be very careful about where they locate um, their latrines vis-a-vis -vis their, their groundwater sources. <clears throat> um, so when these, uh, when water is consumed from all these contaminated sources, this is where you then have high chances of transmission and infection. Uh, who gives guidelines for cholera management? And uh, the first step is to assess uh, hydration, to dehydration. When a patient is brought in to any health facility, they must assess for dehydration, rehydrate the patient and monitor, monitor frequently, then reassess hydration status, maintain hydration, replace ongoing fluid loss due to until diarrhea has stopped, administer an oral antibiotic to the patient with severe dehydration, and then feed the patient. More guidelines, um, elevate the degree, evaluate the degree of dehydration upon arrival, rehydrate the patient in two phases, it will include rehydration for two to four hours, maintenance until the diarrhea abates, register output and intake volumes, on pre-designed charts and periodically review the data, use intravenous routes. Um, severely dehydrated patients, you can use 50 to 100 mils per kg per hour. Moderately dehydrated patients who do not tolerate the oral route. And uh, during the maintenance phase in patients considered high stool pages use 10 mils per kg per hour. An hour. So during maintenance phase, use oral hydration solutions at a rate of 800 to 1,000 mils per hour, matching the ongoing losses with ORS administration. Discharge the patient to the treatment center if oral, oral tolerance is greater than 1,000, your urine volume is greater than 40 mils an hour and your stool volume is less than 400 mils per hour. This is a table which shows you the degree of dehydration. Um, so you've got three classes, A, B, and C, general condition well and alert. There's restless, irritable, lethargic, unconscious. So just by looking at their eyes, if they are normal, it means they are under group A, their tears is normal, mouth and tongue is moist, thirst drinks normally, and then skin pinch goes back quickly. This describes no dehydration and therefore treatment A must be carried out and this can be carried out at home. However, if they present these conditions, they are restless, they are irritable, their eyes are sunken, there are no tears, the mouth is dry, they are eager to drink. And when you pinch the skin, it goes back very slowly. This is show, presenting some level of dehydration. And therefore you must immediately start oral, oral, uh, oral treatment, oral hydration. And then condition C, this is where they present with the patient showing uh, signs of lethargic and they are unconscious, their eyes have sunken, uh, tears are uh, absent, the mouth is very dry. First is that they are unable to drink, goes back very slowly, two or more seconds. This shows that the patient is severely dehydrated and therefore you must immediately hospitalize and commence a 
IVF via hydration process. So the classes and classify the treatment dehydration, two of the following signs, they are lethargic. What do you do? Rehydration with IV or NG. Consider causes and treats. If there is cholera in your area, give appropriate antibiotic for cholera according to sensitive data. Um, sunken eyes, tricks eagerly, they are thirsty, they are somehow dehydrated. Immediately advise patient when to return, give fluid and food. So give them the immediate uh, dehydration phase between two to four hours and monitor. Not enough signs to classify as severe dehydration, treat the diarrhea at home. Plan A and advise when to return. Follow up in five days if not improving. So immediately when a patient presents, uh, there must be some level of isolation. Cases should be quickly removed from home environment. If it is an epidemic, they must find uh, lo local schools, community halls and buildings, uh, mobile hospitals under tents are the places to be converted into temporary treatment centers. Why? Because these have to be monitored, especially if there is such a, a, a huge number and outbreak. So these cases must be monitored and the treatment will be done under uh, it is supervised and done under healthcare professionals. Isolation is necessary till the patient is no longer infectious. Um, oral hydration salts are used. Up to 80% of cases can be treated through this. Your sugar and salt solution. If these cases are severe, intravenous fluids, the ring lactate can be used for the severe cases. And uh, we'll also commence antimicrobial therapy. Uh, this will can diminish duration of diarrhea, reduce the volume of rehydration fluids needed, and shorten the duration of the VP or cholera excretion. So during the rehydration phase, what happens? The goal is to restore normal hydration status, which should take no longer more than four hours. Uh, set the rate of the intravenous infusion in severely dehydrated patients at 50 to 100 mils per kg per hour. The lactated Rengar solution is preferred over isotonic sodium chloride solution because the saline does not correct the metabolic acidosis. The maintenance phase, the goal of the maintenance phase is to maintain normal hydration status by replacing ongoing losses. So the oral route is preferred, the use of ORS at a rate of 500 to 1,000 milliliters per hour. Fluids should never be restricted, so constantly give them access. Antibiotic treatment, antimicrobial therapy is useful for Prompt eradication of um, BPO cholera diminishes the duration of diarrhea, decreases the fluid loss. So anti antibiotic treatment should be administered to moderate or severe cases. And these are the doses that we will are recommended for adults, pregnant women, children greater than three years old, and children less than three years old. We've got dog C cycling. We've got azithromycin for pregnant women, erythromycin, 500 milligrams for every six hours for three days. And for children, erythromycin, 12.5 milligrams per kg per six hours. And uh, erythromycin, 12.5 milligrams per kg per six hours. Zinc therapy can also be included. It has been shown that uh, zinc supplementation significantly reduces the duration and severity of the diarrhea in children. It inhibits the ACE, the CAMP chlorine dependent fluid secretion, inhibits the vasolateral potassium ion channel, boosts the immune system, and increases the absorption of electrolytes. Also, you can implement a vaccine 
system. There's uh, three types of vaccines that are used, which is the parent parenteral vaccine when you are using decoral, two doses administered two weeks apart. Efficacy is approximately 50% and hardly exceeds six months. Generally not recommended. Uh, they killed WC, uh, RPS vaccine, Shanko, killed the whole cell, VPU cholera in combination with the recombinant P subunit of the cholera toxin. It's safe in pregnancy and breastfeeding individuals. Efficacy is approximately 50% after three years. Only mild side effects. And then there's the live attenuated CVT on 03 HGR vaccine, which is Vacora, Vaxcora. Uh, protection is as early as one week after vaccination with a greater than 90% efficacy, unknown efficiency in children under two years, no adverse side effects. So that's the three vaccine system that can be used. And so these are the names of the vaccines that are the Docoral, the Samcol, and the Vaxcora. So Docoral, Cholera, and Travelers Diarrhea Vaccine, oral inactivated, three mil single dose vials, works by introducing small amounts of dead cholera bacteria and non toxic components of cholera toxin in the body. The body allows the this allows the body to make anti antibodies against the bacteria, not licensed for children aged below two years old. The Sanko is a bivalent cholera vaccine and should be administered orally in two liquid doses, 14 days for individuals aged greater than one year. Booster dose is recommended after two years. And lastly, is a uh, Vaxcora is a vaccine indicated for active immunization against the disease caused by VPO cholera, zero group zero one. It is approved for use in adults 18 through to 64 years of age traveling to Col Col Corella, Corella uh, affected areas. The safety and effectiveness of uh, Voxcora has not been established in immunocompromised persons or individuals. Now, controlling cholera, what is recommended treatment centers, set up treatment centers for prompt treatment. Um, these are medical centers where medical professions are the ones that will be running these centers. Sanitary measures, uh, food safety and animal health measures must be implemented. Uh, uh, practice uh, personal hygiene. And um, comprehensive surveillance data adapt to each situation for a comprehensive multidisciplinary approach. If you're dealing with an outbreak, you must then be very clear about implementing the protocols and the hygiene and sanitation measures and practices to prevent. So you will have all measures being implemented. You have the immediate short-term uh, regime that's implemented to treat and stop the spread of cholera. You will have your uh, oral hydration, first phase treatment, um, you'll also have your antibiotic therapy based on severity of the outbreak. And you'll also implement preventative measures, which are mainly to do with uh, improved sanitation practice and personal hygiene. So what do we do for prevention? We can implement basic health education and hygiene. You can implement mass chemoprophylaxis, uh, provision of safe water and sanitation, and implement a comprehensive multidisciplinary approach to handling, treating, controlling, and preventing cholera, further cholera outbreaks.
the approach, water, sanitation, education, and communication. So basic hygiene, uh, health, education, and hygiene, drink and use safe water, look for clean sources of water at all times, wash hands often with soap, clean and safe water, use uh, designated latrines, flush toilets, or bury your feces and do not defecate in any body of water. Cook food thoroughly, especially seafood, keep it covered, eat it hot and wash and peel fruits and vegetables. And lastly, clean up safely in the kitchen and in spaces where the family baths and washes clothes. The education, and the hygiene kits, there's also a need to provision of a water guard for the infected areas. Carboxylic soap must be used. Information on prevention, treatment, and control of cholera must be disseminated using various means, um, carrying out workshops, seminars, uh, roadshow campaigns, door to door household visits, the production and dissemination of jingles broadcasted on one national and three community radio stations. So there's need to be constant information dissemination on all media houses, be it print media, be it broadcasting, be it radio, be it TV. Then trained behavior change facilitators engages households, marketplaces, bus terminals, roadshows and workplaces carrying out and, uh, demonstrations on proper hand washing techniques and safe water practices, such as boiling and chlorinating uh, wastewater. So mass chemoprophylaxis is to do with administering drugs to the entire population, uh, administering drugs to the highest risk group of which some are not affected. It is recommended that the mass propho chemoprophylaxis be restricted to the closed and medically supervised communities, wise to avoid any abuse whatsoever. And lastly, the efficacy of this preventative measure depends on a, to a large extent on the population carrier. Second bit was uh, talked about uh, after education, we need to practice. We need to practice. Uh, water quality. So organizations must evaluate their water supply based on the contaminants it might possibly contain. So US EPA regulations establishes two sets of standard primary and secondary. Sanitary surveillance determines the types of treatment and frequency of laboratory tests of the source of water and the treated water. So this must be done on a regular basis. Um, under the primary standard, what is tested is normally uh, covers all contaminants considered health hazards. Contaminants can be chemical, inorganic or organic, physical, microbial agents or radioactivity. The secondary are not mandatory but are highly recommended to be followed. These standards cover the aesthetics, quality of water, such as color, taste, and odor. So these tests must be done regularly on any bulk water being supplied. So there must be constant uh, analysis of checking for all these pollutants in the, in the water. Then water purification, there's a filtration systems that can be used. So basically for treatment of water, there are quite a number of steps that you take prior to reaching your 
filtration step, and then lastly, it was the disinfection. So the water purification system has a physical stage where your physical insoluble impurities and contaminants are removed, uh, which is the first stage of processing, which flows through a screen and all the debris is collected. And then from that, it goes on to the next set of treatment uh, regime, which would include clarifiers, where you're now adding chemicals to precipitate um, the impurities that are soluble. And then lastly, there's disinfection. Chlorine is the best available disinfectant agent for drinking water. It is added to the water directly as a gas or as a soluble salt. So here's a diagram representing water treatment processes. Like we've said, there are two types of water treatment processes. One is uh, portable water, <coughs> excuse me, which gives us uh, the portable water that we use for drinking. The second one is wastewater treatment. So all the effluent coming from industry and domestic undergoes the similar treatment. However, the processes may differ. <clears throat> so in our treatment uh, processes, we have a primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary removal of trash, large debris, grit, and sand. We have screens to remove all that material. Once the water goes through, it passes through a sedimentation tank where any suspended material will precipitate and uh, be collected at the bottom. Then the secondary treatment, we are removing solids removing um, organics and ammonia, we put an aeration tank for that after the water is pumped from the settling tank, goes through aeration and it will go to clarifiers once again, where you are adding different chemicals uh, to coagulate the impurities and then they are collected in the sedimentation stage. So you're removing all the solids and the insoluble material by precipitation. And then from there, the water is then finally uh, polished to remove any nutrients or pathogens. And this is normally passed through a osmosis system. Mm -hmm. And uh, with tertiary removed disease causing organics, organisms from wastewater, there are four major processes under the tertiary treatment, solid removal, biological nitrogen removal, biological sulfurous removal, and, large, and lastly, disinfection. The three, they differ, there are three different, different disinfection processes. Chlorination, UV light, radiation, and ozonation. So membrane filter technology, it is using pore sites to exclude. And so you'll find the most, the tiniest pores are found in the reverse osmosis. And with osmosis, it has a reverse osmosis, it has a high rejection rate, and therefore it will remove almost everything from the water, all the ions and cations and anions in water and all the impurities. It is followed by nanofiltration with a, an approximate pore size of 0 0.01 micrometer, then followed by ultrafiltration and lastly, microfiltration. So the filters have specific uses based on the desired product in terms of the quality of the product that is produced. 
And uh, the, ta the, the table here shows what can be removed. Like we said, um, reverse osmosis will remove everything else included in this list, including his monovalent salts as well. So physical disinfection techniques include boiling irrita irradiation with ultraviolet light. Disinfection techniques include adding chlorine, bromine, iodine, and ozone to water. And the latest technique is uh, UVVs. So majorly by heat or by UV rays, chemical method would be oxidizing metal ions, alkali, and acids. Disinfection system, um, water systems, five years of all standard pumps and well casing of new systems should be disinfected. Old systems carry Treated water for the first time following disuse must be disinfected. Repaired systems should be disinfected before placing back in service. Disinfect water using chlorine and chlorine contaminated products, ozone and ultraviolet radiation. Water contaminated by the Lambelia or the Cryptosporatia need to need other treatments. And so you can then add your disinfectant by using no less than 100 milligrams per liter of chlorine for at least 24 hours for new systems. So waste disposal, sewage waste, sewage disposal systems must be constructed to prevent contamination of water or pollution of surface water. All sewer systems must be properly maintained. Uh, use of septic tanks are buried watertight recept receptacles designed and constructed to receive wastewater separate liquids, separate pro limited digestion of organic matter, store solids, allow the effluent clarified liquor to be, to be discharged for further treatment. Sewage disposal system should be located and constructed to prevent contaminating, contaminating groundwater and pollution, polluting the surface water. All systems must be maintained to avoid causing a nuisance or a health hazard. Here comes the to the end of the presentation. A few questions just to check, verify if you've been paying attention. What causes cholera? Why is cholera a recurring health problem in some African countries? How is cholera treated? How can cholera be prevented? What are the implement implications of the frequent occurrence of cholera outbreaks? So here we've come to the end of the presentation. Hopefully it has been a worthwhile process. And as you can see, our major challenges are poor sanitation conditions that have created this recurrent <coughs> outbreak. Thank you very much for